I'll um, hope that uh, uh, woken you up, those of you who might be, <laughs> who, who might be asleep. Um, okay, so let, let, let's get this thing started. Um, um, well, thanks for, um, you know, for having me. Um, I think I was at SOAS about 20, about 20 years ago, I um, did a talk. I was part of a conversation here. And um, the interesting thing, actually, now, um, at that time, actually, a lot of African artists were sort of, you know, regarded as uh, not being particularly part of a global conversation. Um, African artists were either um, anonymous artists that sort of inspired Western modernism, uh, Picasso and so on. Um, there was a primitivism exhibition in the 80s at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And um, it was a rather odd uh, situation because, um, you know, we are uh, contemporary people. We, you know, we, um, we watch the same soaps on TV and, um, you know, we are part of a, a modern conversation. And African artists who produced modern art were somehow being dismissed as being a derivative of, of Western uh, modernism. And so, as somebody uh, coming from a, a Nigerian family, a middle-class Nigerian family, grew up in Lagos, um, the same access to, to everything, um, you know, grew up watching Sesame Street. And um, uh, for those of you who know um, Nigerian soap operas, also watched uh, things like Baba Sala on TV. Um, so when I came into London uh, from Nigeria, I came to, first I came to school, and then went to art school. Um, and I couldn't quite understand the kind of um, discrimination that existed and the level of um, you know, ignorance, really, to be, to be um, frank. Um, and um, I remember being, well, I started off, you know, painting the nude. Then I, because um, that was my art training, I trained as a painter. And, you know, at that time, I was looking at people like Van Gogh and um, Sickert and Bomberg and... Uh, uh, um, the London School as well. Um, and then I decided I was going to become political in the practice. You know, I got interested in political art. I um, was making work about, you know, Perestroika, which is um, what was happening in the, in the then Soviet Union. And I'm sure, you know, this has been said over and over again. So those of you who would like to yawn, you can yawn now. Um, no, but you know, it, it's an important point. Um, so, I was making work about Perestroika, and one of my tutors when I was at, but I'm sure actually at the time, said, why aren't you producing authentic African art? What's Russia got to do with you? Why aren't you producing ethnic art? Then I started to ask the question about authenticity, what is authenticity? Um, for a contemporary Nigerian, uh, um, you know, I grew up in a Yoruba household. Yes, of course, I do speak Yoruba. I speak my own language. And, you know, as you would in Nigeria, you'd speak English at school. Now, I've been thinking about this. My generation, we are... Um, completely different. We're not, um, we can't go back to tradition. Um, a number of my, you know, English colleagues were not expected to look at medieval art or make work about Morris dancing. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so why would I then be expected to, to um, care about traditional Africa? I'm not interested. Um, history is important, of course, and I've been to a number of ethnographic museums and I used to go to uh, the Museum of Mankind, um, just off Cork Street in those days. So off I went to the Museum of Mankind and the British Museum in search of my authentic um, Africanness. Um, I didn't find it there. I just found very scary masks there. <laughs> uh, ritual, that, those objects are ritual objects. Um, you know, I'd rather watch Soul Train, to be honest. Um, you know, so, you know, this is um, how I grew up. So where was I? Yes, so the story about the tutor, that's where I was, yes. So I went to uh, Brixton Market, Brixton Market, yeah, to in search of my authenticity. And, um, well, went to the fabric shop there. Then I started talking to them about the fabrics. Um, when I was in Nigeria, I used to you know, see the batik and I used to wear the fabrics. Um, and, um, but actually grew up thinking those fabrics were um, authentically African. Then realized, well, I was told in the shop that they're um, Dutch fabrics. Um, influenced by um, Indonesian batik, then produced in Manchester and also in Holland. Um, now, I have to give you context here. I was at art school, so I was studying art and I was studying, um, you know, abstract expressionists um, and also I was, you know, looking at, you know, Rothko, um, you know, Pollock, Barnett Newman. I, you know, like everybody else, I paid homage to, to Rothko in the Rothko room at the Tate's. Um, I never could really find what people found there, but it was supposed to be quite kind of spiritual. Um, you know, so I did go in there to, to, to contemplate the Roth Ghost. Um, but anyway, so back to my work. Um, I was looking for direction, and so, um, but I could not find myself in the conversations about global art and contemporary art. In the, um, I think it must have been in the 80s, there was a show at the Pompidou Center called Magician de la Terre. I think that was the first exhibition in which um, non-Western artists were featured on a, on a kind of an international platform. But then those artists, the Western artists were, were um, featured as artists, but the non-Western artists were featured as uh, shamans or magicians. And, um, but I always wanted to be a contemporary artist and be part of the conversation. And I was interested in, in um, you know, pop art. And, uh, um, and of course, the, at that time, it was really fashionable to look at the discourse around postmodernism and feminism at the time. Um, and there was a lot of, uh, you know, writing on post-colonial theory. So there was, you know, a questioning of the Western canon. And so the, it was a time of the non-white male artists, uh, you know, challenging the system. 
and asserting their own uh, visibility. So at the time, uh, a, a number of American uh, feminist artists, uh, Cindy Sherman, uh, Barbara Kruger, and you know, the David Hammonds in the United States, and Rashid Oren in the UK, um, he started a magazine called Third Text. And Third Text was a critical text magazine that kind of dealt with um, you know, non-Western practices and trying to make them visible. Now, it's important to, uh, to do all this uh, um, talking because it's important to understand that art doesn't actually happen in a vacuum and to actually understand the political and the historical context of my practice. And so this was a time also when Margaret Thatcher was in power and the, uh, Margaret Thatcher was talking about conservative uh, Victorian values. Uh, Victorian values were values I couldn't possibly identify with at the time because of course we all know what happened in the colonial era and what um, well, the Victorians did to my heritage. So, um, and so, back to, to, to the work, um, I started then to think about uh, Western modernism, but also to think about um, high art and popular culture. And so the first series of works I did using the fabrics uh, um, I did the I did double dutch. That was one of the early paintings, and I was kind of looking at um, fragmenting this modernist idea of abstraction, but then introducing a pattern and fabric into that. Now the um, so I'll just show you a, a number of works. Um, So, starting with painting and looking at this notion of authenticity, um, I mean, I did this series called Totem Paintings. I mean, they came, you know, I did those paintings uh, much, much later on. Um, but the work then evolved into, first of all, I mean, looking at the formal aspects of the work, and representing them in different ways so that the actual gallery wall becomes part of the work. It's not separate. The, co the context becomes part of the work. And there are also, I mean, things like, you know, fetish paintings, which are just kind of... Um, parody is also a very important, as important aspect of the work. Um, it's a sort of um, mimicking of what an African artist is supposed to do, but then uh, ensuring that actually all the parts are industrially produced and essentially actually Western. Um, so there's a um, New York toy painting. And I must also add, now the work, people don't often talk about the um, aesthetic aspect of my work. Now, essentially, I consider myself um, an aesthete and an artist. Um, I do want to challenge things. There's a, there's a degree of um, activism in the work. Uh, but, the, but the activism is also formal in nature. So there is, there is an, there's a questioning that goes on within the form of the work itself. And so um, the first move into working with costumes, um, well, I was, I, I was inspired uh, to do that whilst looking through uh, some costumes at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And then I started what I describe as um, ethnicizing the aristocracy. And, um, and then, um, you will notice that some of the uh, uh, figures are, are headless. And um, the headlessness actually began as a joke about the French Revolution. 
and uh, when the aristocracy had their heads um, you know, chopped off. Um, so this is based on Gainsborough, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. So that's uh, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews without their heads. Um, it's a newly married couple in the original painting. They're in their estate. And um, you know, their portrait's done in front of their estate. And so what I've done is um, gently uh, remove their estates and their heads. Um, so, and um, well, this actually was done in 1998, but it remains topical, um, of course, with uh, you keep and the unfortunate um, um, discrimination that's been going on. Um, you know, alien, alien obsessives, uh, mom, dad, and the kids. Um, it's a kind of a regular nuclear family. Um, you know, we were kind of um, scared of people that kind of don't look like us. Um, and there's a degree of, and of course, you know, a dysfunctional family. Um, again, it, it's poking fun out of a kind of a ridiculous uh, um, situation, really. Um, and Cloud Nine. Um, so I did some things with, uh, you know, with, with space. And then, so the, a lot of the work, and that, that still sort of happens, there are, you will, as I go through, so what I've decided to do, because after all, I'm a visual artist, I've decided actually I'm going to just show you a lot of images. And I want you to, um, you know, just look at the images and kind of engage with them in your own way. Um, and so a lot of kind of uh, politics does enter into the work, that some of them are, are related to current affairs, but they're not. Uh, they're, they're not necessarily about politics, they're political in themselves. Um, but also, essentially, they're a form of uh, poetry. And art, after all, it's a form of uh, magic making, and it has the potential for transformation. And so that's that aspect I'm interested in. I'm not necessarily interested in the kind of literal kind of protest art. I'm interested in, there is also always a degree of uh, frivolity in, in the work, but actually I'm interested in my own right to aesthetic frivolity as an artist of African origin. In other words, I don't always have to be uh, somebody kind of protesting against something. Actually, I do have the freedom to enjoy my work and to basically um, indulge in whatever fantasies I wish to. And uh, this is um, based on Fragonard's painting. And um, I mean, you've all, you see, there's a, there's a correlation between Ed Miliband talking about zero hours contract and what happens in the work. It may not actually be obvious, but by actually deconstructing um, aristocratic iconography. I'm exploring the issue of class war and the inequality between the North and the South and the inequality between the, the haves and the have-nots. But this is not, this is um, done in a kind of a, a fun way um, but it does underpin the work. So there are uh, those things there. Uh, they might not be immediately obvious, of course. 
And then, of course, there's uh, what's known as institutional critique. So I do make interventions into period homes or uh, other kind of you know, museum settings. Um, but again, that's not necessarily, I mean, I'm not necessarily fond of, um, uh, of art speak myself. Um, I do, um, you know, relate to them, understand them, and then, you know, chuck them in the bin and just um, enjoy my work. Um, you know, so uh, this is uh, uh, Flower Cloud, and I also happen to enjoy ballet. And I actually, I don't have that film here, but some of you may have seen it. I saw, I made a, a piece based on Swan Lake called um, Odile and Odette. And it's a black ballerina dancing opposite a white ballerina. And they mirror each other, but it looks like a mirror. But uh, you may be able to find it, find it online. But, um, so there's always an element of, there's an element of theatricality uh, performance, uh, masquerade in the work. And there is a degree, too, of gallows humor in the work. Uh, how to block two heads at once. Of course, we know that uh, the, there's a lot of conflict in the world, and uh, so the work does touch on some of those things. And this is, um, so anyway, I should just show you some pictures. Um, some of them I will talk about. Some of them I won't remember why I did them. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, let's just look at, have fun. Yeah. And of course this is, uh, um, I was exploring uh, things to do with the environment. So this, I did a series based on global warming. And uh, you can see the kids kind of precariously uh, <coughs> falling off this overheating uh, globe. I really like color and I, I enjoy picking fabrics. And of course, I love designing frocks. I have I work with a number of great costumiers in my studio, and um, I work with a number of really great people in my studio, um, and we just have fun designing fun things. So uh, uh, Cannonball Heaven. Um, those cannonballs wouldn't blow anything up, as you can see. I, I did this series um, at the time of the, um, the riots in London, and, um, and also the Arab Spring, yeah. And this is my tribute to bankers, in fact, um, at the time of the economic crisis. So I did a show at Stephen Friedman Gallery, and this is The Last Supper. Uh, I think there's a central figure there uh, that's um, uh, Bac Bacchus, uh, the god of wine, is central. So it's replaced the uh, figure of Christ in that, in that uh, image. And those kind of champagne kits. And uh, say no more. I'm a bit, I'm a bit of a hypocrite though, because I do like the money. So, um, okay. 
Cake Man also another tribute to bankers. And that's something I did for Crisis, the homeless charity. Um, impelled Aristocrat. Uh, Ladder Kids I did at the Barnes Museum in the US. Um, that's a piece based on aspiration. And then pieces from a show I have in New York at the moment at James Cohen Gallery in Chelsea. Uh, the whole show is about the environment. So the ballerinas there are based on, on Greek gods. Um, and they've got weapons. It's from a show called Rage of the Ballet Gods. And it's these ballerinas as Greek gods, but they've got these uh, weapons. And they've got gloves on their heads depicting various environmental uh, disasters. And this is the refugee astronauts. After the apocalypse, I can never say that word. I can't get my Yoruba tongue around some <laughs> English words. Uh, but anyway, there you go. Uh, some of you may have seen this. This was at the Haywood Gallery. Uh, there are black footballers printed all over the fabrics. Um, Yeah, this was a documenta, and um, I don't think it needs much explanation. Um, so it's about sex tourism. And I was reading about the Grand Tour, and what that was the time when people used to go to Italy and France to learn about culture, but I read that they learned about other things instead. <laughs> so, um, so some of the work does come out of, you know, like things I read and um, I'll scramble for Africa. Yeah, this is um, in the 19th century when Africa was being divided by uh, European countries and the kind of 14 European countries I think decided that they would you know take a piece from you know divide Africa into different countries and so this is me reimagining that conference the Berlin conference but then they're kind of headless um, so this is uh, an installation I did at the National Gallery and I Remember that some of the uh, people on the board at the National Gallery were not sort of entirely pleased about this this um, intervention. Um, so I removed portraits of some slave owners and replaced them with these, those uh, figures, and the, and they're shooting a pheasant in the middle of uh, the National Gallery. Um, kind of blooded pheasant. And uh, this is based on a French ship that sank off the coast of Senegal, I think. Um, I think, yeah, OK. And uh, another crash. OK, so I'm just going to go through some, you know. How am I doing for time, actually? Um, I guess so. Uh, egg fights are uh, based on Gulliver's Travels. And it's about two groups of people. Uh, they, they had a, a war about which side of the egg do you eat first, something along, <laughs> something that's silly. <laughs> and so, um, so that's what that's based on. It's based on Gulliver's Travels. And then I did a 
project called the British Library in, of the Brighton Pavilion. And so there are 10,000 books. Um, I, I, this was made when there was all the talk about you know, foreigners, uh, you know, and um, the books have the names of um, British people who came from elsewhere, basically, originally. And, uh, and this is currently a show at the William Morris Museum in Walthamstow. Um, I took the William Morris family um, portraits and reconstructed them uh, with the local people of Walthamstow. And so then I produced these diptychs. William Morris, of course, was a great socialist. And um, so, that, so you can see the difference. Uh, the, on the right, the people who live in Walthamstow now it's very, you know, become very multicultural. So it's a, it's a way of exploring the changes, I guess, in Britain through those uh, William Morris portraits. And there's a, a, a dress uh, displayed there. Who that? <laughs> okay, and then I did a series uh, on the London Underground, uh, photographs on the London Underground in 1805, no, 1998. That was a long time ago. <laughs> um, diary of a Victorian dandy. I enjoyed dressing up, it was fun. We took over this stately home for three days and got dressed and had our photographs taken. And that was a lot of fun to do, I think so. Uh, and none of us could keep a straight face shooting this one. <laughs> but being very professional, of course, we got it done. Um, okay, so. And then the picture of Dorian Gray. I'm rather fond of Oscar Wilde's writings. And also looking, using the picture of Dorian Gray to talk about my own uh, disability. For those of you who don't know, I got the virus when I was 19 in my spine, which left me completely paralyzed. And I've addressed some of that in my work, but not directly. Uh, but Dorian Gray is about time and the body and also the aging of a dandy. And um, when I was much younger, I fancied myself as a dandy. <laughs> but um, so I was very much interested in dandyism and I was reading a lot about it. And people like Bob Rommel. Um, and so I made this series of, uh, of work, the picture of Dorian Gray. And then this is work based on Goya's The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. Now, I did those, I think, after George Bush I th think Dobia said something about the axis of evil. And so I explored this notion of uh, irrationality, and I did it through re the reconstruction of Goya's etchings. Uh, okay. And series of photographs um, based on Dante's Inferno and the different levels of hell. Okay. All shot in my studio. And some things I will talk about, some things I will not talk about. 
but it doesn't matter. Okay, so, uh, and I very much like Andy Warhol. So, uh, those are uh, some Warhol, well, myself as, uh, as Warhol. Um, those uh, pictures are in my show in New York at the moment. So, if you happen to be hanging out in New York, I just came back, loved it. <laughs> and so, if you're hanging out in New York, you can check them out in Chelsea. Uh, and check out the new Whitney Museum as well in New York. It's pretty cool. Um, okay, so, and those are photo stills from my film. Uh, that's the first film I made. I lived in Stockholm for six months and I worked with Swedish television. But that film is, in fact, about the Iraq War. While I was living in Stockholm, I discovered the story of Gustav III, who was fighting wars in Russia in the 18th century, and while these people were starving at home, and, but he, he loved going to the ball, and so he got shot while he was at the ball. And I wanted to transform the Gustav himself to a woman and his killer to a woman. I kind of felt I just wanted to change uh, the power dynamics uh, within that narrative. So, plus I wanted to dress up a lot of actors and have fun there. And this is another film I made which is uh, based on uh, Traviata. Puccini, and um, <coughs> I've jumped too fast there, but anyway, um, and so photo stills from Odile and Odette, a collaboration I did with the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden, and I subsequently went back to do more collaborations with the Royal Opera House. Um, and I've got a, a kind of a ballerina based on Margot Fontaine spinning around in a glass ball. It's a fun piece. Uh, my first piece that actually kind of moves. And that's still, um, you can see that at the Royal Opera House. Um, if you would care to, to look up, if you look down, you'd miss it. Because it's quite high up. Um, so this is um, my, uh, I went, to do public art, public art. I decided I should be a, a nice person and take my work outside of the elitist gallery, and put it on the street. So when I was invited to, um, to do this in Trafalgar Square, I really enjoyed it. I, for the first time, I could actually have great conversations with, cab with cabbies, London cabbies, about <laughs> the fourth plinth. And all the cab drivers know about the fourth plinth and they have an opinion. And um, so this is based on Nelson's ship in a bottle. And with it, and this is now in Greenwich. Um, so you can see it there, it's permanently installed. And um, this is the ballerina of the Royal Opera House. This is in Howick Place, not too far from Victoria Station. It's called Wind Sculpture, and it's the fabric blowing in the wind. I think it's delightful, don't you? <laughs> yeah. So, I think art should be fun. Okay, so, um, and, um, and, of course, I have to mention Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Because Yorkshire Sculpture Park commissioned the first wind sculptures. And um, so, and I know that I will be in trouble if I, don't big up Yorkshire Sculpture Park. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So big up to the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> okay, let's move on from that. Um, okay, so. Um, uh, Chicago, Chicago, yeah, Chicago. Uh, Museum of Contemporary Art, Chicago. Um, installation there. Um, Basil, Miami, that's a Basel, Miami. And Germany, I think, somewhere in Germany, yeah. Ah, this is my studio. This is where the magic happens. <laughs> so, well, my studio, actually, I should tell you about my studio. I have a project space in my studio. It's been going since 1998. And I have this space downstairs. I work upstairs, and I have a proposal box outside of the space. And um, artists put in proposals, and they get residences for a month. I accept only group shows, and I do a supper club every two months with uh, based on um, based on an artist, and uh, a chef cooks a meal based on that artist, and you can buy tickets online, and the money goes from the supper clubs go back into supporting the artists. I've been doing that since 1998. And I learn a lot as well, actually, because that's how I managed to stay in touch with the younger generation. And uh, let's see. Can't actually make out what those. Oh, this is guest projects. Uh, this is a supper club, yeah. I think that's all I've got to say. Yeah.